Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sermon for Sunday, September 7th, 2014. Today, Pastor Bob Hiller starts a new sermon series entitled Greatness. Today's message is based on Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. Let's listen in. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our text today is going to be taken from the reading in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18 as we begin our series on this theme of greatness. Let's begin today then with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, that you have sent your son Jesus to us to humble himself and die uh, in our place on the cross. And we pray, pray today, Lord, that as we learn to follow him as disciples, you would teach us what it means uh, to follow him humbly. Teach us what it means to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Teach us to depend on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I've mentioned a few times now, we're beginning a new series today on greatness in the kingdom of God. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to be dealing with this question from the disciples. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the way the series is going to play out is, is we're going to answer this question this week, who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is. And then over the next number of weeks, we're going to figure out how we live as the church in light of Jesus' answer. How do we live with the greatest among us? How are we to treat those who are the greatest in our midst? And that's kind of the question uh, that Matthew 18 is going to be dealing with. And so that's what we're going to be looking at over the next number of weeks. But as we get into it today, we need to get at the answer to this question. Who is the greatest? How does one become great in God's kingdom? We defend, we defend, we depend, uh, we tend to define, that was much easier to say when the lights were off here, uh, we tend to define greatness in terms of what we call, I'm going to call it today, the law of achievement. Okay, the law of achievement says this. If you achieve a certain ideal, then you are great. If you achieve a certain ideal, then you are great. If you accomplish your goals, if you have a successful job, if you have a happy family, if you, and there's the big one, if you make a name for yourself in this world, then you are a great person. Those who earn the good life, those who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and overcome their old demons, those are the real heroes in our world. Those are the ones who inspire us, right? Those are the ones who write books that we read so that we too can be like them and we can achieve something. We can make a name for ourselves. The great ones in our world, at least according to our culture and if we're honest, even in our own minds, are the famous athletes. The, uh, the powerful CEOs, the adventurous entrepreneurs, even those who, who help us, people who do wonderful things. Like we look to firemen or, or policemen or even someone like Mother Teresa who, who set out to, to achieve a goal and helped many, many people. We look at those people and we say, they're great because they achieved. They lived up to a certain standard. They fulfilled the law of of achievement. Now the law of achievement is nothing new. The disciples were working with the same idea. They were working and operating with the same ideal of greatness in their mind. And so today in Matthew chapter 18, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, how do we become great in your kingdom? What does it take to be one of the great ones in your kingdom? Jesus, who do you think is the great one? And really the underlying question is, how can we kick them out of their chair so we can take the spot of greatness? How can we become the great ones? So Jesus, who is the Muhammad Ali? You guys remember Muhammad Ali? I am the greatest, right? Yeah. Uh, who is the Muhammad Ali, the Michael Jordan, the Steve Jobs, the Beatles, the, the in and out, you know, of the kingdom of heaven? Because we all know that in and out is the greatest burger joint in the planet. That's just the reality of it. How do you become the in and out of God's kingdom, right? How do you become the greatest? And as much as, you know, you can tell I'm setting you up right now, and as much as we're trying to figure out, you know, oh, we don't think that way in the church, we absolutely do think that way in the church, don't we? We have a different standard of greatness in the church that I think we have to kind of deal with. Let me give you an example of, from my own life growing up in my own home congregation, Peace with Christ Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. One Sunday, when I was a young man, probably 11 or 12 years old, we caught a glimpse of greatness in our church. Because one Sunday... Vance Johnson came to our church. Who's Vance Johnson? 
Oh, suddenly all the football people don't have any comments over here, do they? Oh, look at this. It's, of course, it's opening Sunday. Of course I'm going to talk about football. Vance Johnson was one of the great wide receivers for the Denver Broncos in the late 80s. He was part of a group of gentlemen known as the Three Amigos, Ricky Natil, uh, Mark Jackson, and Vance Johnson. They were very famous if you lived in Denver in the 80s and you were a young boy. You knew who the Three Amigos were because they were all over the TV. They were going to Super Bowls and losing all of them. And they were on Taco Bell cups. All right, so you could go to Taco Bell, and if you got three supersized meals, you could get one of each of the, the three amigos on your Taco Bell cup. Well, one Sunday, straight off the Taco Bell cup, Vance Johnson walks into our church narthex. That's the hallway outside of the sanctuary for churches who have narthexes. We have a parking lot. Uh, but this is, uh, this is, it was wonderful. And all of us boys are standing there in our DCE. His wife had been doing some work with him, and so she invited him to church, and he came. And she introduced him to all of us young boys. And we made a big circle around him. We're kind of standing in the circle. And he said, so how are you guys? And we all said, <laughs> you're Vance Johnson. You've got passes from John Elway. Uh, can we touch you? You know, it was really weird. Like, it, it had to be one of the more awkward Sundays for him. Because we all just stared at him. We didn't say a word. But what could we say in the midst of Denver Bronco greatness? Right there in our church. In the eyes of the world, especially the eyes of the world of an 11, 12-year-old boy, this man had achieved greatness. He had been to three Super Bowls. He had done amazing things in the league. He was a remarkable man who could catch amazing passes. Therefore, he was great. The greatest was in our church that Sunday. So if the disciples had come to us boys and said, who is the greatest in church this Sunday? Who would we have said? We would have said, oh, Vance Johnson, what are you talking about? Did you see who is here in the church? But now Jesus... They come to Jesus, though. They don't come to a bunch of young boys. They come to Jesus, and they say, who is the greatest? And you know Jesus is not going to give them the answer we would give, right? Jesus is going to give an answer that turns everything on its heads and completely wrecks the way we understand everything. <laughs> Jesus, they come to him and say, who is the greatest? And Jesus goes while they're trying to figure this out, and he picks up a small child, and he stands the child among them, and he says, I tell you the truth, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. For whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not the successful and the powerful and the rich and the great wide receivers. It's the child. Now, we hear this and we, we sort of tend to sentimentalize it a little bit. Oh, isn't that cute? Kids are cute. So if I want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, I guess I have to become cute, right? That's not exactly what he's getting at here. But we do sentimentalize this thing. We kind of get all of these sort of optimistic pictures of innocence in our minds. Oh, look at the children. They're so full of potential. They're so innocent and they just, they just need to be filled up with love and possibility. And we think of all the wonderful pictures and cute pictures of children and all the future they have ahead of them and how exciting and wonderful this might be. And we have this picture of, of potential and innocence. You know who has the picture of little children in their mind of potential and innocence? You know who has that picture in their mind? Grandparents, okay? And then once that picture starts to change just a little bit, you know what grandparents do? They send the kids home. So then they can keep those wonderful pictures in their mind, and mom and dad have to deal with the reality of the delightful little children, how soon we forget what it's like having kids around. See, in the ancient world, I think they had a better perspective on this, or a more realistic perspective on this, because in the ancient world, they didn't see children as little potential buckets just waiting to be filled, but rather they saw them as as needy and dependent. They were not considered to be role models. Children in the ancient world can, were considered to be ignorant, incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong, defenseless and gullible. Left to themselves, they would either get hurt or into a lot of trouble. And Jesus brings this child with that kind of understanding into the midst of them and says, and now there is greatness. That is greatness in my kingdom the needy, and the dependent. Jesus defines greatness by putting a child there as dependence. To recognize and confess your helpless inability before God. To depend on Him for all things and not to set out seeking personal achievement and self-serving success. Greatness is neediness. Greatness is dependence. Let me give you another example from my church growing up of actual greatness, Jesus kind of greatness. 
that we had in our church every single Sunday. Vance Johnson came once. This kind of greatness was in our church every single Sunday. And this gentleman's name was Paul. Paul was a kid in my Sunday school class when I was in elementary school. But here's the thing about Paul. I was in elementary school. Paul was in high school. And Paul couldn't really function very well among the other high schoolers because Paul was bound to a wheelchair and he couldn't move on his own. Uh, he could, but only with a tremendous amount of mental strain. He couldn't speak. He just kind of would grunt and moan when he wanted things. Paul had some form. They never officially diagnosed him, uh, but Paul had some form of cerebral palsy which made him unable to do things, incapable of doing things. And so he was uh, having to come to the little kid's Sunday school class, sometimes because his mom was teaching, and then she just felt like this was a better place for him to be. So that's, that's where Paul was. And every Sunday, Paul came to our Sunday school class, and when Sunday school was over, we had to take him to the stairs and, and bring him up on the, uh, we had a, a chairlift there at our church. We had to bring him up the chairlift and bring him into the same narthex where we saw Vance Johnson, and we had to sit there with him. And every kid kind of traded off, and, and we had to feed him donuts while he waited for his mom and dad to come and get him or waited for his brothers to take him into church or something like this. And so we would feed him donuts, and he would cry. And I don't always know why he was crying. I don't know if he was crying because, well, well sometimes he would cry because he was choking on the donuts. And we had, to learn, we had to learn how to take the donuts out of his mouth. But sometimes he would cry for that. Sometimes he would cry, I think, uh, though, because the whole situation was just too much for him. We, to be honest, and if we want to be completely honest, you know, we were little kids. We didn't want to stay there feeding him donuts. We wanted to go play. We didn't want to be around him. Not, nothing against him, we just wanted to go play, and yet here we had a responsibility that we didn't like. And th so there we sat there, and we tried to figure out how to get away from him, and then we would feed him donuts, and he would cry, and it was just, it was just sort of a very uh, difficult thing. And I always think in my mind, after reading this story today, if Vance Johnson, if, or if Jesus had come to our church that Sunday when Vance Johnson was there, and all of us boys are standing around staring and just gaping at this man, Jesus would have gone over and grabbed Paul, and he would have rolled him into the middle of the circle, and he would have said, now why are you staring at that guy when he He's here because he's the greatest among you. Paul is the greatest disciple in this church because he is completely dependent upon me for all things. And if you want to be great in my kingdom, you need to repent of your idolatry of achievement and ability. And you need to become needy and you need to become dependent on me. Paul is the greatest in my kingdom because he can do nothing. And he depends on me for everything. Now this is a language we don't even speak. We can't even really wrap our minds around what Jesus is getting at here. This is, this is the language of the kingdom of heaven. Like when you go to a new country, you have to learn the language. Well, we're being transferred out of this kingdom of darkness and we've been brought into Jesus' kingdom of light. And in this kingdom, there's just a whole other way of thinking. There's a whole other way of speaking. It's a renewing of our minds. Here in this kingdom, things don't operate according to the laws of achievement. Here in this kingdom, things don't operate according to the laws of accomplishment. In the kingdom, things operate according to grace and mercy. God gives and we receive. There, those who are called lowly, incapable in the eyes of the world, Jesus, he calls them great. And in this kingdom, it's what Jesus calls you that matters. Here are those who are accused and attacked by the law of achievement, who look out on the people around them and, and, and feel bad about themselves because they cannot seem to get to where those people are. Those people who are beaten down by the world and the law of achievement. The underachievers, the failures, the ignorant, the humble, the broken, the incapable. In this kingdom, their faces are on the Taco Bell cups. <laughs> Jesus says, those are the great ones because they're needy and incapable and they depend solely on Christ. On Christ who knows what it means to be needy. On Christ who knows what it means to be incapable because he set aside his glory obediently to the Father and became needy and incapable when he was born of a virgin and took a nap in a manger and could do nothing for himself. Who grew up to be the lowest of persons ever by suffering and dying on the cross in our place. Dying a shameful death. Being, being despised and rejected for not achieving what the world thought a Messiah should achieve. Suffering and dying a shameful death for not being the kind of God that we think he should be. He became the chief sinner on the cross and a dead savior. 
And from that death, God raised him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus, who was despised and helpless in the eyes of the world, and who in many ways is still despised and helpless in the eyes of the world, was called great by God. In fact, God said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. See, in the kingdom of God, it's not achievement or ability that matters. It's what God says about you that matters. It's God's word to you that matters. You are forgiven. You are baptized into Christ. You are my child. These are the things that make us great. Greatness in shame, shame in greatness, power in inability, and inability in power. Or as Jesus puts it, the first are last, and the last are first. Things don't work the same under the reign of Christ. So now you and I are sitting here, and we're, we're hearing this, and we're thinking, oh, this is all very you know, interesting and profound, but what does this even mean practically? Like, how do I do this? How do I become needy? How do I become incapable? What do I do? Just kind of sit around and, and start feeling sorry for myself? Should I pretend to be incapable? Should I pretend like I can't do anything and I should start making everyone else do everything for me? I cannot pretend to be that way. I cannot become a child. I, I can't pretend to be incapable. It's impossible. This kind of word from Jesus is killing me because I simply can't do it. Exactly. And now Jesus got you. You can't do it. You are completely and utterly incapable before God of doing anything he demands of you. You can't. And that's why Jesus has come for you and for me and for the rest of us who are incapable. What we must do today is repent of our idolatry of achievement Repent of our ability and rejoice in our Jesus who has made us completely incapable and called us children of God. Children. Children of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have made us incapable. Teach us to know what this means. Teach us to believe it and teach us, Lord, to serve you faithfully despite our inability. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.